Coming up next on This Week in Computer Hardware, is your mouse a security risk? Intel says quantum computing is still far away. Mid price GPU picks, drops, alt, high profile mechanical keyboard reviewed, five nanometer chips are everywhere, and so much more. It's all coming up next on Twitch. This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Using the same password everywhere is a security nightmare waiting to happen. LastPass easily creates unique passwords for every site. Visit lastpass.com slash twit. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is twit. twit. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 554, recorded on February 20th, 2020. Is your mouse a security risk? Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch Weekly Show that aims to bring you all the hardware news. Today, we're getting old school. We're going to talk about quantum computing, the future of HTC's VR program, and the middle ground of GPUs. I'm going for total Captain Kirk speech today. Joined by my science officer, Sebastian Peak. <laughs> I'll stop that now. <laughs> thank you, Patrick. Actually, I, not. I was in that mindset of, oh, we're doing Shatner? Like, thank you, <laughs> Patrick. I, so much to talk about today on the program. Why? Something. You're doing a sort of a Shatner beats Deadpool kind of thing, and I'm digging Probably. it. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, this is a family-friendly show, and the majority of the Deadpool humor will not be allowed to survive the edit. True. So, sorry, folks. <laughs> I think the uh, DVD version, the unrated DVD version of Twitch, <laughs> Very which I produced special. myself in my basement. Yes frightening consider uh i was i okay we i'm not going to start the the week out with the biggest story this week although some might think it is the biggest story certainly asus but uh i was kind of blown away by this um you guys were talking about it on pc per um there's a review of the thing in question up on uh, the fpsreview.com which is the asus prime x299 edition 30 motherboard and uh, it is a 30th anniversary motherboard from uh, Asus, who it turns out, <laughs> as I believe Joshua pointed out up on PC Per, uh, has been making motherboards for longer than Intel has, which is kind of a bizarre thing to contemplate. Remember when Intel didn't kind of command the majority of what happened on a motherboard? Yeah, back when they just made the CPUs. They made memory and, too early on. Yeah, I think. But yeah. But man, but, this thing. Uh, oh, you know what? I I just figured it out. This is why you were doing the Shatner voice. If you haven't noticed, the <laughs> logo that Asus is using for their anniversary looks suspiciously like the Starfleet insignia, and it's all over like the packaging. It's on the heat sink for the South Bridge. It's on the back, like IO shield. It's interesting. They went with that design. It's pretty wild to look at this. Uh, <laughs> you know, when you uh, if, if you go to PC Per and uh, read Jeremy's uh, write up on this, um, it's kind of wild to realize like Asus um, 1990 Asus releases the Intel 486 motherboard. Uh, Intel's 420TX didn't arrive until 1992, and uh, basically this is a a, a, a refreshed. An excited, did, 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 a fancied version of the Asus X299 Deluxe 2. Um, it is uh, a $750 motherboard, which is, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, that's staggering. It's commemorative. If you leave it mint, you might be able to pay your children's college tuition with it someday, or at least their books. Well, the other, yeah. Or the other thing is to, to get the most out of it, you've got to buy a CPU from Intel, which is, like a high-end HEDT CPU, like the 10980XE, right. which is about a thousand dollars. So then it gets it gets really expensive. You're at that you're at Threadripper level expense here. <laughs> but it, I mean, it's cool looking. I don't think it's worth the price premium over some of their other even other higher-end boards, like some of the uh, right. Asus 
Republic of Gamers stuff that's around 600 to 700 is... Well, it's also, I mean, one of... One of the things that the FPS review points out is it's this is an odd time to release an X two ninety nine uh, based system, right? LGA twenty sixty six is somewhere beyond long in the tooth and well into old, <laughs> and the two ninety nine chipset itself. Um, and as you were suggesting or pointing out before, uh, you for the same amount of money you can get more power out of a Threadripper, but um, you know this is. Uh, you get bragging rights with this. You get fanciness. Bueller. Yeah, this is this is like one of those uh, deluxe versions of an iPhone because Asus already makes motherboards with all the same features. It's just right. this is dressed up and it's in uh, you know it, they they always have every imaginable add-on in the box with these higher right. end boards. But do we really need a custom like fan controller add-on, et cetera, et cetera? But, you know, hey. Well, don't forget the Somebody anniversary will. artwork and the custom color. <laughs> Bueller? So. So. <laughs> In any case. It's a tough sell. You're not selling me on it, Patrick. You're not. You're not. All right. It's not happening. Well, how about this? Congrats to 30 years of Asus and Intel. Congrats to Asus's continued success in the PC market. And uh, congrats to all of those listening right now who are purchasing or have purchased a $750 motherboard on an aging chipset because you get style points. How's that? Um, shifting gears radically, uh, Wired's got a pretty good write-up on it. Uh, Eclipsium, uh, security researchers, quote, found that a slew of network cards, trackpads, Wi-Fi adapters, USB hubs, and webcams all had firmware that could be updated with unsigned code it lacks any cryptographic verification. In other words, it could be rewritten without any security check. Um, you know, I know someone out there is going like, who cares? Well, what if you do something, you know, what, what if it's your keyboard? <laughs> and uh, what if there's just enough intelligence in your keyboard or there's just enough room in there um, to do something, you know, uh, brutal in the firmware, right? Um, you know, touchpads are complicated. Some keyboards are complicated. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things we've, we've pointed out in the past is the glory of USB is you plug a widget in and it's, it says, I'm a keyboard. You come plug a USB device in and it says, I'm a keyboard. Uh, but it could also be a, um, well, a rubber ducky, for example, which is a tool from my friends over at Hack5. Um, you know, which basically pretends it's a keyboard and then enters in, uh, uh, you know, types, you know, and listens and types and listens and types. I should say pauses, not so much as listens. Um, and they have more sophisticated tools that basically pretend to be keyboards and do fascinating things. Um, this is, you know, a little, a little more raw, um, you know, uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, there's no, uh, you know, there's no authentication. There's no authentication of the firmware updates for devices, um, you know, and uh, they got really specific, right? The researchers were looking at, uh, quote, touchpads and trackpads, Lenovo laptops, webcams found in HP laptops, Wi-Fi adapters from Dell laptops, a Via Labs USB hubs, and a Broadcom network interface card. Hint, there are a lot of these things out in the uh, world at this point. Quote, yeah. they demonstrated they could update each device's firmware with no verification, and in the case of the webcam and USB hub, without even having administrator privileges on the target computer. Um, you know, so they didn't write any proof of concept malware. Um, they just basically proved that they could change parts of the firmware, modify the firmware, uh, you know, so... Their claim, you know, is that if we can do that, then we can do more nefarious things. Um, I wouldn't start panicking at this point, but, you know, unless I worked for a three-letter agency or a large bank. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting um, to realize that, you know, so many devices are fundamentally unsecured and are avenues for terrible, terrible things. Um, they did actually... Uh, build some proof of concept malware for the uh, for the NIC for the Broadcom uh, network interface card, um, 
so they could actually um, grab what was going on, uh, uh, you know, more information um, or to break out of, quote, an infected virtual machine to intercept and send malicious commands to other virtual machines that use the same hardware. So that could be some exciting. Of those, some of the hardware you mentioned, it's they're so prevalent, ubiquitous yeah. chipsets like You'll pick a real tech if it's a real tech nick and it's in like ninety percent of desktops right. or it's the chipset that's used in so many laptops that still have Ethernet, or if we're talking about a Wi Fi chipset that's extremely common. Trackpads, either they're coming from mm -hmm. Synaptics or I can't remember the name of the other uh, common brand, but if they come up with just a basic usable firmware that's been modified. It's actually kind of scary. I, when things like this come up where they're kind of vague and, well, we're working on it, like it's possible. And I just feel like there's probably some dark corner of the world somewhere where this is in use. And they're just like, oh, wait, this is this was discovered. OK, so eventually you have to come up with a new vector to do the things we've been doing for years undetected because nobody right. knew it was even possible. And this is kind of scary to think that like this keyboard behind me, I've done a firmware update on it before. There is absolutely no verification you just click the executable it says do not power off the device it, and there are you know countless bluetooth devices that are like this we all carry around phones of course that have regular firmware updates but just think about some of the quote unquote dumb things that rely on firmware that connect with usb mm -hmm. and it would be an additional cost to put some sort of security chip in all these devices which isn't going to happen for the lower cost segment so it's interesting you'd have to have i don't even know what you'd have to do it pretty much have to be security chips in the devices right something along the lines of what apple did i, I remember there was complaints early on in the life of lightning that if i'm getting the connector right apple's little connector to place the 30 pin connector because there was a little security chip in every single one of these cables and devices and if you didn't pay a licensing fee to Apple, you couldn't get the chip. So there were all of these devices that either didn't work or Apple wouldn't give it a, a um, certification to. But it checked that you were using something that was verified before it would allow the connection to the phone. So right. something like that may have to eventually happen. That was kind or, of the gist of, of a lot of people they quoted in this. Um, they talked to Lenovo, they talked to Dell, um, you know, uh, they talk to uh, other researchers um, who are basically, you know, like, yeah, it's really theoretical, but maybe we, we start signing firmware. This would yeah. be nice to protect against these attacks. Um, Lenovo stated that, uh, quote, Eclipsium's report addresses a well-known industry-wide challenge stemming from most peripheral devices having limited storage and or computational capabilities. Lenovo devices perform on peripheral device firmware signature validation where technically possible. Lenovo is actively discouraging, excuse me, encouraging, not discouraging, encouraging its suppliers to implement the same approach and is working closely with them to help address the issue. Um, Dell said that, uh, quote, we are now working with our supplier to understand the impact and will communicate any necessary security updates or mitigations. So, you know, it's a bigger issue um, that has to be solved on a sort of an industry level. No, no single company is going to fix this. But uh, it would be nice if they started trying. <laughs> Oh my goodness! So, uh, two hundred fifty to three hundred dollars is the new mid-range, huh? What yeah, was the old mid-range? So. I think it was around the same. I think a mid-range card used to be about a two hundred two hundred fifty dollar card, but mm -hmm. hey, inflation. It's been a couple years since the ten sixty was the go-to two hundred to two hundred fifty dollar card. So, right. And it, interestingly enough, TechSpot, who did this mid-range roundup. Uh, what did they call this? They're, uh, it's the Radeon RX 5600 XT, which is a $279 card, versus GTX 1060, versus, and that's the 6 gigabyte version, versus the GTX 1070. And of course, there are some other cards uh, in their charts here, but they were just kind of revisiting this. It's a very valid thing to go back in time to. It's something I wish I had more time to do myself, where it's not like, Everybody out there gets a new graphics card every six months, but 
right. you know, reviewers are getting graphics cards at least every six months. So I, I've gotten to the point where I don't even want to go back and retest Pascal anymore because I have so <laughs> many touring cards to get through every time I right. begin the process of retesting on newer drivers. But they went back and retested a GTX 1060 six gigabyte version because, of course, that was originally launched at three gigabytes and six against a, t- a 1070, a uh, 2060 Super, and an RTX 50, uh, 5700 XT along with that new RX 5600 XT. And I'll have to check to see which RX 5600 XT they're using. It is the MSI Gaming X. So that, I don't think MSIs all have the faster memory. I think the Gaming X does, though. And that's that's absolutely <laughs> huge. We've talked about this before, but the the memory speed with Radeon cards is a, a really big factor in overall performance. And the cards that have the faster memory are about 10% faster than the ones that don't. But even so, we're looking through their charts here. They're doing 1080 and 1440 at very high settings. So ultra quality for the Outer Worlds, for example, RX 5700 XT is on top, which I would expect, but only by a frame over the 2060 Super, which is a very strong card at around the $400 price point. And that's the thing. Like We're talking about two to 300. The top of their chart is right. $400 cards. So if you look at the bottom half of each of these charts, that's the 5600 XT, the old GTX 1070 and 1060, and the 5600 XT is as fast as a GTX 1070, basically. And in some cases, faster. Like Call of Duty Modern Warfare, ultra quality. It was faster than a GTX 1070 at both 1080p and 1440p. And, I mean, games with Vulcan, like Red Dead Redemption 2, AMD right. tends to have an edge with Vulcan, which gets kind of exaggerated. Um, yeah, like these higher settings, like 1440p. The 5700 XT is way ahead of the 2060 Super, 74 frames per second versus only 61. And then behind that is the 5600 XT, 50 frames per second, which is playable. But really, that mid-range, here's the sad thing. It's gotten so much more affordable to get yourself like a 1440p monitor these days. It's still twice as much as a 1080p monitor. If you go on Amazon right now, you'd find around $200, $220 would buy you a 1440p gaming monitor get you started but it's much you. better 1440p my for for given the price delta it's a much nicer monitor than it would have been a couple of years ago for the same oh, amount of money. absolutely but then the problem yeah. becomes driving it because then you look at benchmark results like these and right. just even at high quality settings you're still not getting a 60 <laughs> frames per second at 1440p with a 270 right. dollar graphics card so really you need you need to spend 400 dollars on the graphics card to to be you know in that 1440 high settings world and you have to spend five hundred dollars to be at fourteen forty ultra settings if you run really really high detail settings. I think I, I have sort of backed off a little bit myself. I'm back in the world of kind of high settings. I had a conversation with somebody in the industry where they're basically like, you know, game developers tailor games to run at high settings. Essentially, you can turn on extra eye candy with ultra, but high is kind of the target. So. Uh, anyway, uh, the the point with this article just kind of showing you how these older Pascal cards from NVIDIA stack up against what AMD is pushing as their mid-range kind of like ultimate 1080p gaming solution with the 5600 XT. And AMD's I mean, it, card... I feel bad for my 1060. <laughs> yeah, it's... And, and, and I would have liked to see at least one of the touring like six, GTX 16 series cards in here because uh, a 1660 Ti... That's kind of right in that same GTX 1070 world. Right. It's close. A 1660 Super is close. Where a, a 2060 is a little bit faster than a 1070, a 2060 Super is a lot faster than a 1070. So anyway, that's the problem. I mean, we could add, every time I start looking at a project and what they were obviously facing here at TechSpot is, how many cards do I benchmark from scratch? And they picked five, which is fine. They did it at two resolutions. And you have an answer, like the... 5600 XT is faster than the 1070. So if you're considering upgrading, it's absolutely worth it. And if you think about it, a 1070 was a $400 card. So it's it's nice that you could upgrade a couple years down the road, get better performance, and it would cost you only 279 But 
they're using a more expensive card. So they're in that 300 to $330 range where the faster 5600 XTs live. I just got done right. testing a $329 5600 XT, which was uh, not as fast as the last one I tested because it didn't have the fast memory. So not every manufacturer is interested in overclocking the memory on those, which is a, a problem. But anyway. Just sounds kind of annoying. Yeah, I, I I feel bad. My I and we're not talking about my article because I haven't even published it yet. But what I said in right. the article about the 5600 XT that I just finished is that it's not manufacturer's fault when like this was an XFX card. XFX decided to offer a three year warranty with their card, and mm -hmm. they decided internally that they were not going to overclock the memory because I'm just guessing here they weren't going to be able to. They weren't going to get the reliability out of the cards over a three-year lifespan, overclocking the memory 24-7 like that, that they wanted. And there are cards out there like the Sapphire Pulse that I tested first where they just went all out. And they right. overclocked the memory all the way up to 14 gigabit per second, 24-7. The really fast core clocks, uh, 1610 megahertz game clock and the, the maximum 1750 megahertz boost clock. And it's a screamer. It's absolutely fantastic. I hope it'll work fine. Maybe it's maybe it's not an issue. Maybe they use different memory chips and it's not a problem to run it at that speed. But it is a fantastic performer. And then, unfortunately, for companies like XFX, I know MSI, some of the Asus models, they still have 12 gigabit memory because that's how it was manufactured. AMD sprung this firmware update on them at the last minute after cards had already been manufactured, packaged, and even right. shipped off to e-tail. There were, there were cards sitting in warehouses that had 12 gigabit per second memory on the boards and AMD wanted an update to 14. So not everybody hmm. ratified this. Not everybody said, we're not going to validate this fast memory, sorry. So my initial thoughts about this card when it came out last month were kind of tainted by the fact that I received a BIOS update before launch and was kind of under the impression that everybody else also was getting these BIOS updates. And it turns out they all got them, but some of the companies decided to just overclock the core and leave the memory alone. And <laughs> overclocking the core makes very little difference when you're stuck <laughs> on the because the memory is what's holding you back. That's the problem. These Hate are it when that memory happens. bandwidth constrained. So, well, if you are cyber cyberpunk. 2077 constrained. Uh, oh yeah, you should be aware that there is a cyber 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 twunk cyberpunk 2077 themed GPU that's being uh, given away. I think uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 200 of these RTX 2080 Ti with quote cool looking cyberpunk branding. I just had to bring that <laughs> up because I was admiring the <laughs> GPU in the corner. The soft, glowing oh, yeah. CTU uh, in the corner. Yes. So that's also up at TechSpot.com. If you want to figure out how to win it, go to TechSpot.com and search for Cyberpunk 2077 themed GPU. Because they do nice work and they deserve the traffic. Um, Intel and QTech unveiled details of the first cryogenic quantum computing control chip, Horse Ridge. Which is a great name for a processor. Uh, and as Intel notes, it's important because the quantum resource community is at mile one of a marathon towards demonstrating quantum practicality. Uh, which is a very polite um, way of saying uh, quantum computing is, you know, far, far in the future. Um, but uh, I, you know, it was funny because I was trying to figure out earlier in the day a uh, article uh, popped up on Pocket, which I get through sort of every time I open up a new tab on Firefox. Um, There's a really great uh, article from uh, Scientific American in 2018. How close are we really to building a quantum computer? Intel's head of quantum computing talks about the challenges of developing algorithms, software programs, and other necessities for a technology that doesn't yet exist. So. Uh, if you you know like to delve into the idea of quantum computing, um, every time I do, my head starts to hurt and I get frustrated. Um. <laughs> That's how I'm feeling right now. 
I'm looking at this and seeing sentences it's all like about Intel qubits. is exploring silicon spin qubits. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's essentially right. It's it's Schrodinger's bits, right? A qubit can be a zero and a one at the same time. It can occupy a superposition, mm. and the idea is that it can do all the calculation. Well, not all, lots and lots of calculations, uh, all at once. So, um, you know, if someone would like to talk to us about quantum computing, I mean, you know, yes, it's, it's funny, right? If, if quantum computing. Uh, becomes practical, then basically uh, uh, everybody should be using. You know, if we th if we thought quantum computing would be practical in the next couple of years, it would be time to use like four thousand bit or maybe ten thousand bit uh, keys for our email. But we're not quite there yet. But, and uh, I noticed also one one final snarky footnote. I see this is built on Intel's twenty two nanometer FinFET low power CMOS technology. Oh, so, it's a space for cooling the qubits. Yeah, 22 nanometer though. Come on, think of all the qubits if it was on like 10 nanometer. All in good time, sir. <laughs> well, that'd be Pony Ridge by then, Clydesdale Ridge. I have no idea. Maybe Bison Ridge. Oh, I like the Bison Ridge. That's more phonetically pleasing. Well, we've been stalking bison all over the American West for the past few weeks. Yeah, um, bison on the brain. Bison on the brain. Uh, and also, I want to give a shout out to the uh, animated video that was right next to the. So we had Horse Ridge, you know, mile one in the 26 miles of quantum computing, and, uh, and a, a new animated video up right next to it, or a link to it in the Intel newsroom. Uh, how Intel makes chips concept to customer. A simple overview of the manufacturing process. That's chip, by the way, you just saw there talking if you're. Uh, Watching the video. That is From design engineering through mass operations and assembly and testing to create these actually complex devices. So I can't. I'm sure he informally yeah. would be referred to as Chippy behind the scenes. <laughs> he's a distant. Not to be confused actually, with Chippy. He's a great. Yeah, he's he's Clippy's great grandson, and apparently, <laughs> uh, you know, they they reproduce quickly. The lifespan of a of a paperclip is not as long as you might think. Well, it is cool. You're going to like design, mask ops, fabrication, die sort, and prep assembly, and test warehousing. I mean, they really kind of cover it all. In a very chirpy... With an adorable mascot. <laughs> Maybe they'll put them on t-shirts. I'm chippy. Imagine. If only I'd saved my clippy t-shirt. Imagine what it would be worth on eBay right now. <laughs> At least 10 to $20. Possibly oh, less. Oh, my goodness. In other processor manufacturing news, uh, TSMC, um, quote, likely going to handle all of Apple's five nanometer A14 chip business and likely Huawei's Kirin 1000, which is also five nanometers. Um, so, uh, you know, Jeremy did a nice, his usual excellent discussion. Um, but it's kind of crazy. Uh you know, 6.74 billion in investment uh, in expansion of their factories. Um, Samsung's got Qualcomm's five nanometer production, and uh, so these five nanometer lines will be in addition to their seven nanometer production lines, which quote include AMD's AMD's uh, Ryzen 3000 CPUs and Navi GPUs, including the ones which will be found on Microsoft Xbox Series X and Sony's PlayStation 5 consoles and Apple's current seven nanometer Gen A13 chip. So they're they're becoming such a juggernaut. I don't think people maybe even if you're interested in this industry, you may not realize how much of it actually goes through foundries like TSMC, right. which is just make the chip. So they take the chip design from a company and then they are the ones who actually produce the silicon and they make like Patrick said, they make all of Apple's stuff. Well, I mean, they don't make all of it. Apple has, has worked with other foundries before, but the majority of it, and they're the ones right. who have that jumped all over 7 nanometer, where they, they were able, the wins that they got, where they were able to get these customers as diverse as Apple, AMD, and others. Intel is, of course, the notable uh, name here that's, that's absent because they have their own foundry. But... TSMC is just killing it. I mean, they 
they produce all of NVIDIA's GPU chips. Those are still currently mm-hmm. at 12 nanometer. All of the Ryzen 3000 CPUs are at 7 nanometer, all the Navi GPUs, which of course also means, like you said, the consoles, like the new Xbox Series X, the PlayStation 5, those are all going to be manufactured, at least the chips are, at TSMC. Mm-hmm. So there's kind of like this world leader in chip production now because they have the edge on their uh, process technology. They were the first to get to, I don't know if they were the first. I know Samsung has their own, but they're the ones who can do it at scale and they're building, they're expanding and, and building more factories and making them bigger. So it, at some point, it feels like they're going to become kind of a household name. I don't see how there's any way that they won't become, They, I don't think they'll become the next Intel, but right. I, I've been thinking for the last year or so since Intel's had all these problems that have been so public. It's been a couple of years really for them, but why don't they just go to TSMC? It, if they help TSMC scale up and build some new factories, TSMC has the process technology down and yields have obviously been getting very good because we're seeing greater availability of 7 nanometer parts like the Ryzen 3000 CPUs. Right. They were only hard to find for maybe the first couple three months and then they started to become easier and easier to find and now here we are a few months we haven't been a year and it's easy to find all these things and actually we're starting to see discounts on things so crazy crazy five nanometer is crazy to think about it is crazy to think about uh asus uh says loose screws responsible for overheating (laughs) rog strix radeon rx 5700 series gpus there's a lovely write-up right there at rog.asus.com. And uh, February 15th, 2020, we missed this last week. Notice, well, I guess this happened after we recorded the show last week, if I want to do math. But uh, notice, regarding thermal performance and cooler mounting pressure for ROG Strix Radiant RX 5700 Series graphics cards. And uh, it's very uh, – it's it's delightfully dry. We would like to address yes. user concerns related to the thermal performance and cooler mounting pressure we use in ROG Strix Radiant RX 5700 series graphics cards. Uh, initial batches of ROG Str- – I'm going to say you know 5700s – were torqued to 30, 40 PSI based AMD's baseline recommendations. While those guidelines provided leeway to apply more torque, we took a cautious approach because we were dealing with a new 7 nanometer GPU and didn't want to risk damage to the die. After receiving user reports regarding temperature issues, we performed extended R&D testing to find the optimal pounds per square inch range for our graphics cards without compromising GPU reliability. So from January 2020, they now torque them down to 50 or 60 PSI, quote, resulting in improved heat transfer from the GPU to the heat sink. So if you would that... like to have your Radeon RX 5700 series that has the old screws and you would like it modified to use the new mounting screws quote please contact your nearest aces service center starting in march of 2020 and we'll happily perform the upgrade for you then it has a list of the eligible cards on there this is the the same issue i know uh, gamers nexus had talked about this with uh was not necessarily an aces card but just amd cards in general because of the use of thermal pads which is so common in the industry because you have additional right. leeway a thermal interface, there has to be something between the actual GPU die and the heat sink. And a lot of companies use pads, and depending on the thickness of the pad and its composition, mm-hmm. you need more or less pressure. And the way that I remember Steve at Gamers Nexus did a video where he fixed it by just finding little washers, like tiny washers you might find right. on a, a all-in-one liquid cooler or something. And he put them or behind the, the screws. Stores. Yeah, he put them behind the screws and reattached the heatsink with the screws that it shipped with. But the washers enabled mm-hmm. him to apply additional pressure, and that's exactly what they're talking about here. So it's nice that they're offering some sort of a program to get this taken care of for people. You know, if you uh, – something to note uh, at the bottom of that page. First of all, uh, Aces would like to apologize for any inconvenience caused. Um, but uh, there's also this giant asterisk that says the ongoing effects of the COVID-19 coronavirus outbreaks may affect shipments of necessary components to local ACES service centers. This time frame is an estimate and may change without notice. We appreciate your patience and understanding of this matter. And, uh, you know, just uh, another moment when coronavirus is rearing its ugly little head if you're waiting for your GPU screws. 
So, oh my goodness, uh, Snapdragon X sixty five G modems are uh, on our five nanometer kick today. Uh, we should add the uh, next generation five uh, G modems. Um, Ian Cutrus, excuse me, Doctor Ian Cutrus over at Nantech has a nice write up on that. Um, you know, we've had the X fifty, the X fifty five, and uh, earlier this week, uh, Qualcomm announced the X sixty. Uh, 5G modem RF system. It's uh, the world's first 5 nanometer 5G baseband, 5G millimeter wave sub-6 aggregation, 5G sub-6 carrier aggregation across FTD and TDD. And uh, essentially, this is going to go into flagship and premium phones. And uh, um, one of the things Dr. Kutch just points out, he's kind of fascinated that he decided to announce this was going to be on the 5 nanometer, um, given that... Uh, the recent news in TSMC and uh, where they are at with the five nanometer rollout at their fabs. But uh, I'm curious, I'm really curious to see what the real world performance on this. Um, you know, if you're talking about uh, theoretical performance, um, you're looking at like um, between the process, carrier aggregation between sub six and millimeter wave, you're talking like 7.5 gigabit per second download speeds, theoretical. Uh, I'm super curious to see what this means in terms of real world performance. Um, having dealt a bunch recently with a radio that does not do 4G LTE carrier aggregation, uh, I am a big fan of anything that adds carrier aggregation into your digital lifestyle. <laughs> I just look at these theoretical speeds and yeah my home cable internet connection is 100 down and 10 up those are megabits per second by the way right and just to think the, the imagining a fiber connection where i just had a uh, sync uh, like you know a, th a thousand megabit like a gigabit connection and this is they're talking three gigabits up and of course carrier aggregation it's using multiple data streams simultaneously to, to give you this performance but it's fascinating i mean I don't, I don't really know i think i don't want more speed with a smartphone and then you think about ultra high quality video streaming from your device or using this in a laptop to do like 4k skype calls or something in perfect quality so it, it would be great to be able to be anywhere and have a faster internet internet connection than most homes but sadly, uh, with LTE, I generally already have a faster internet connection than my home. But that's another story. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, iFixit did one of their infamous, delightful, awesome, famous, super cool teardowns of the uh, Motorola Razor. And uh, in uh, what I consider brutal news <laughs> it's actually less repairable than most apple products um the upside uh if you look at the repairability score summary uh the only driver you need is a standard t3 torx the delicate primary display is replaceable if you're determined and uh well look at that one over there a big part of that is that uh the glue the outer covers are glued on um you have to take darn near the entire phone apart to replace the batteries, as in plural. Uh, the charging port, which is a place where phones just love to die, uh, is delightfully old school, much like the name. Uh, solder, the charging port's soldered on the main board, which means if the charging port goes, uh, you know, so is the main board. And, quote, complex construction and multiple flex cable booby traps makes for tricky repair work. So do yourself a favor. Don't drop your razor. Don't tear cables out of your razor. Be gentle with your razor. Because, uh, you know, or buy the extended warranty. <laughs> it's just, ouch. A one. Yikes. A cruel, cold one. So... Uh, in other folding phone news, since we seem to be mildly obsessed between the two of us, uh, Verge has a nice write-up on the, quote, folding glass in uh, Samsung Z Flip. And uh, it's funny, uh, the, the Sean Hollister wrote this one up. Uh, 
And he points out very directly that, quote, Samsung declared it had broken the laws of physics by bending glass, specifically by making a leap from polymer screens to ultra-thin glass technology. Um, Samsung ultra-thin glass. Ultra-thin glass that folds. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, basically the glass does have polymer. It's easy to scratch. Uh, It doesn't do well under aggressive dust tests. Dust <laughs> tests. It's a really it's difficult like, couple of words to say together. Uh, and my personal favorite part, uh, Samsung's claims around glass, and I'm quoting here, have now retreated to the ridiculous tagline, tough yet tender. Uh-huh. So uh, the thing is, though, it actually is glass made by uh, German manufacturer Schott. It has a soft, scratchable plastic layer up top and... Uh, what Mr. Hollister points out is that hopefully in the future, they will not need that uh, polymer layer on top of it. Um, and then it gets into a really cool discussion of how glass can fold and uh, what's going on with the physics of folding glass. And, uh, you know, or as the nice people at Corning say, quote, one of the most common misconceptions about glass is that it breaks because it's inherently weak. And if you've ever been hit with a beer bottle, you know that's not true. Uh, or stood on top of a greenhouse in the middle of the glass. So I just love the stuff. fact that the the cover on this glass is is easily scratched. And let's see, what's the application here? Oh, folding it onto itself. It's like the perfect scenario for it to get scratched. A little fleck of something is in there and then you close the phone, glass grinding on glass in your pocket, you open it up again. Where'd this phantom gouge come from? Don't worry, <laughs> it's just a thin polymer layer on our bendable glass because in 2020, people need folding phones again, even though really they don't. Not that you're bitter about this. <laughs> no, not at all. Are you- not that I'm bitter about this, this short-lived fad that... You know, I, I think there is absolutely a place for for folding and flexible display technology. And I think about things like like the the, the L, LG's OLED TV that comes up out of like a, right. a box and just like rises up and then it goes down again. Think about uh, having a projection screen that's completely in, unobtrusive and comes down. And there are solutions like that already, but making it more accessible but without having to use like projection technology, like maybe a micro LED screen someday, like wraps around a wall or something. And I actually just watched a right. fascinating like behind the scenes of the Mandalorian where they were showing how they use LED light, uh, like uh, display panels for a set. Mm-hmm. So the walls of the set and the ceiling of the set are all micro LED displays. So a lot of really? the stuff you watch on that show, it's an actual. Like they use Unreal Engine for the background, so it's like a video game. And it's then the they're holodeck. walking around in this room. <laughs> it is. It's exactly. I was watching this video. Like this is the holodeck. This is the holodeck. Just need to put like some different uh, moving pieces on the on the floor, and it. They're running around in here, and it, in in the in camera, it actually looks like oh, there's really a mountain back there because it's slightly out of focus, and you would never know because of the quality of the display that it wasn't real. So That's and then cool. be, because the ceiling is micro LEDs too, if if there's bright light, then that is the actual light coming down and lighting the scene. So it's environmental lighting is coming from a display up above them. It's crazy. What were we talking about again? And incredibly cool. We we're talking about uh, the uh, the physics of folding glass, yes. or or just creeping towards the physics of folding glass, and uh, finishing off our. De rigueur coverage of uh, folding phones, which have yeah, seemed to have taken Let's over our on. lives. <laughs> what? You don't want to talk more about that? <laughs> okay, well, you know, let's swing, uh, switching gears yet again. Um, this is actually, uh, I go so far as to say this is a pretty case, but I say that about most cases. Um, but this actually is a pretty case. And uh, it is a fractal that defines 7 XL full tower case. You tore it out of the box and stuffed it full of shiny, happy components. What's the word? 
Oh, it's, this is really big. There's two versions. And if you're familiar with Fractal, formerly <laughs> known as Fractal Design, their Define series has been kind of a go-to case for a lot of people for years now. I, I think the first one I actually used was the R5. R4 was a really popular case in the enthusiast community. The The last version of it they released was the R6, and that was actually two years ago. I went back and found my review of that from January of 2018. So mm -hmm. here they are, a little over two years later. They've dropped the R, but this is the Define. This is the seventh generation Define. comes in a regular and an XL. Uh, a plain side panel or tempered glass. And I have the dark tempered glass version, which is a black interior tempered glass, kind of your standard tempered glass. They also have one where it's a sure. white interior and a clear glass side. But it it's very similar in all the good ways, the previous defined series cases. So it's a big kind of monolithic design. They use kind of um, an all black, no frills, no RGBs look. And mm -hmm. it's... It's a Define, and it looks exactly like every other Define case I've ever looked at, which is a good thing. <laughs> and there are people who really like that kind of more, uh, I guess I'd call it a classy aesthetic. It's very boxy. Mm -hmm. There's no asymmetrical interest here. Like the last, actually the last fractal case I looked at was the Vector RS, which was kind of an asymmetrical thing. But build quality is extremely high. This thing was, it's over 36 pounds. Just pulling this out Whoa. of the box, like, oh wow, this is a uh, this is a very heavy case. It's it's thick steel, lots of steel, and it it feels like it's it's built to last for years. And because it's a Define case, it has this door on the front of it, and behind the door, you have your front fan intakes, and mm -hmm. you also have two five and a quarter inch drive bays. They dropped the second drive bay from the R6, going from the R5 to the R6, it's back with the seventh. So, you know what? In 2020, you can put two DVD-ROM drives in there if you really want to. Put a Blu-ray drive in there, put a DVD-RW drive in the other opening, or maybe use a, like a, I don't know, a fan controller or something. But you have that option. And <laughs> these cases, this one in particular, is extremely open on the inside. It's it's a very large case. This is a full tower, nine expansion slots with an extra three vertical expansion slots if you wanted to do a vertical GPU mount. They sell an optional kit for that. Tons of room for water cooling. Nice. The radiator and fan options for this were kind of crazy because you can do like 480s on the front and top, another 280 on the bottom, 120 on the back. So I didn't get too in-depth with this one. I just did kind of a first impressions, like took it out of the box, did a build with it. Checked out the build quality. Uh, I've seen some thermal testing out there. I know Gamers Nexus did a very thorough like thermal and uh, noise review of the case that's out today. So check that out. But it's it's all the good things about a defined case. So if if you like that series of cases and you like, I don't know, like this is they didn't offer a full tower before. So this is kind of right. like the full tower version of the Define R6. There's a couple of minor changes. They did a little bit of a different thing with storage this time. Something I need to get into with this case because it can hold up to 18 drives simultaneously depending on whether it's 2.5 or 3.5 inch. But it's it's kind of a throwback case in a good way. Like Not, not just because of the two 5.25 inch drives, but because right out of the box, it's got four dedicated 3.5 inch hard drive bays two more up on the side in the back and then it comes with a couple more in the accessory box and you can put a whole stack of them inside the case to the right of your system where there's a big gap that can become just a bunch of hard drives if you want it to so as with previous defined cases the hard drive capacity is massive with this thing and there are a lot of cases that come out they're not quite this big but they have like two maybe three uh, hard drive bays and a couple of SSD mounts behind the motherboard tray and that's about it. So this is, mm -hmm. buy this case if you ever want to do water cooling, you ever want to put like, you know, a dozen hard drives in a computer case and it's it's got room for it and more. And there was a ton of room around even an EATX motherboard for my build. So 
definitely worth looking at. It's expensive. Uh, I think the base model without a glass side panel was 179 and the version that I reviewed was uh, 209 So not cheap, but kind of, I mean, for a full tower premium case, if you look at cases like the Obsidian series from Corsair, those are very expensive. So this isn't quite up to that level of premium, but it also is not $500. So it's always nice when it's not $500. Yeah. <clears throat> Unless, you know, you're into the luxury case scene, in which case... Go forth and power the economy. Um, you guys also look at uh, Drop, the company formerly known as Drop.com. Um, they have some of the most beautiful custom keys I've ever seen have been available on Drop.com. They've done a ton of keycaps, keys, mechanical keys, fully, you know, keyboard kits, keyboard upgrades, keyboard bases. Um, and uh, they are uh, dropping. <clears throat> Their uh, alt high profile, uh, and if you haven't been following Drop for the last couple of years, uh, Drop dot com, Dropbox, I should say, uh, is now Drop dot com. Dropbox dot com is now Drop, oh, and they started doing a, a whole lot of, yeah, and they uh, they started doing, uh, you know, building more of their own products and making more stuff available for longer periods of time. Um, this is. Uh, Certainly not the most expensive keyboard we've seen, but but definitely on the the higher end of things. Uh, Christopher Coke did the write up over at PC Per. What was he? How was he feeling about it? this? Is a two hundred thirty dollar keyboard? Yeah, that comes in a plain brown wrapper, which I am okay with. Um, and uh, you know, it's uh, there's no number pad, which is so fascinating to me. Uh, yeah, I know. I was looking at this. Keyboard. I was, and it's. I was, I was putting Chris's review in our system here and looking at these pictures and like, I kind of love this design. It's a 65% yeah. key. So it's, it's got, a, and I'm not huge into the keyboard scene. There are people who are really into it. It's very small. Imagine a keyboard where you've got your, your standard QWERTY keys. You've got like escape tab, yeah. caps lock shift. Control, it's a laptop left. keyboard or an yes, older Apple there's, keyboard. There's no function keys <laughs> up above. And then over on the right, you have yeah. no numpad. So it's very, it's trimmed down to the bare essentials. What's cool about this, though, is that you still have all that functionality because this thing is built in what they call layers. They have a software program where you come up with what you want different layers to do and then save it to the keyboard. And you have a modifier key you push down, kind of like with a laptop. It's exactly like a laptop, where with a laptop, you have like a function key you press down and suddenly. Uh, a part of your keyboard is your numpad or function keys become like brightness up and down, that sort of thing. So you can program all of that kind of functionality into this keyboard and you decide what all of the different keys do and what the modifier key is and stuff. So from a, a usability standpoint, even though it's very small, it's tremendously flexible. And there, there are a lot of fans of this kind of keyboard because it takes up a minimal amount of space on your desk, but has all the keys you actually need, depending on what you do. Some people cannot live with a 65 or a 60% keyboard. This one, I think it would be great to type on. Uh, Chris said he loves keyboards like this for just writing. And he'll just sit down and it's kind of confidence inspiring to have a really nice dedicated keyboard. And he can kind of just stay yeah. on track, right? And <laughs> kind of like a typewriter. Think about a typewriter. It's like that. It's like having a typewriter keyboard, but for your computer. There's no frills. This thing. You're talking to somebody who's used a... Model M, IBM Model M keyboard for yeah. 90% of his writing for the better part of a decade. <laughs> I know, am familiar. And, and people love those because of the feel of it, the weight of the keys. The, yes. And it's it's not just that, it's psychological too. Like you'll sit down at one of those, you probably feel differently at that keyboard than you would at like a $10 throwaway keyboard, even though they do the same thing. It's just not the same. Right. And this... This is so customizable. It's 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 expensive, yeah. But we're talking about the, it's it's from it's the kind of yeah. It's from the sort of um, DIY community side of things. This has, get this, hot swappable key switches. Even while the keyboard's on, great. you can just pry out <laughs> one of the key switches and say, I don't want a brown here. I want a Cherry MX red right there, and just pop it in, and it will work. And uh, it's super customizable extremely well built it's like 
aluminum block over this thing. Mm -hmm. This is the high profile. There was a low profile version of this before that did not have this massive aluminum frame around it. So they basically just put a mm -hmm. frame around the low profile. That's the high profile. Chris went all out with this review, by the way. And the 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 key caps that it ships with are PBT. And the thing about PBT, and I cannot remember the actual scientific name, polybutyrol tetra something or other, but it's extremely strong. Yeah. This is a substance that does not melt if you threw it in the oven at 400 degrees. I think it's like 430 yeah. something degrees to melt PBT plastic. And they they make them out of two different pieces of plastic. So the internal frame of the keycap is separate from the exterior keycap. And what this allows, among other things, besides just the strength and the particular weight and feel of PBT, is that you can have the character on the key cut out of the top layer of plastic and then the lower layer fills it in so you're never going to have like the a letter or a number rub off of a key because it's all part of the second layer of plastic so anyway even though it comes with pbt keys keycaps which on their own are a, an upgrade he went all out and bought a 90 dollars set of keycaps from drop <laughs> to put on this review keyboard and customize this even further. Like he, it's the Drop Plus Mat 30 MT3 Dev TTY keycap set, which is linked to in the review. It, it's awesome though. If you look towards the bottom where he, he did this, if you're looking at the mm -hmm. review, it, it looks like he's just transformed this into an old terminal. And it's like, like an orange return key, an orange escape key, those like darker shaded like tab buttons and stuff. And it looks fantastic. So it, the thing is, uh, he's sort of on the side where people get into it hard enough that they're they're buying all the components and building up their own right. keyboard from scratch. But this is a great way to go if you don't want to do that. 230 sounds like a lot of money, but considering this is a popular set of keycaps that's around $90, spending a lot of money on just the keycaps, then buying all the switches, putting it on a board... And putting it in some sort of a shell or frame, I think you can easily spend that much money or more. So, definitely for not for the faint of heart, two thirty is the most expensive. That would be the second most expensive keyboard we reviewed that I know of. So, I, I also want to warn people: if you're not familiar with Drop.com, um, it can be incredibly addictive. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not familiar with uh, Drop.com. I, I want to warn you now. They they uh, they have everything from quilting to ultralight uh, camping gear. Uh, a large audio section that occasionally has tortured me. Watches. Um, just uh, just beware. <laughs> it's a place you can go and start spending a lot of money. And uh, it's uh, gosh, where is it? I feel like I'm. I can't find the quilting section. I'm very sad. Oh, look, there's uh, Mr. Speaker's Ether CX headphones from a drop. They do some things they do are custom versions of products they make with manufacturers uh, where they haven't put on the design. Some of them, for example, they've got Biodynamics DT770 Pro, one of my favorite headphones of all time. You can also use them to drive tent stakes. Um, I am not really exaggerating on that one. Um, they do a, a, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, they have also actually announced a, uh, a uh, headset uh, uh, Indiegogo that they're working on right now, but uh, there's a lot of stuff there, and uh, you know, I have been sorely tempted to buy some of the custom keycaps. Austin emails Twitch at twit.tv looking for a gaming laptop recommendation. Austin, he says, "Hey guys, I'm in the market for a good gaming laptop. I'm not in a huge hurry, but wanted to see if there are going to be any major releases in the next two months, or if I should just go with something on sale now." I've been looking at the GS65 Stealth 478 MSI gaming laptops with the RTX 2060 and 32 gigabytes of RAM at Best Buy. That's a well-outfitted laptop. Yeah. Looks like a good laptop for a decent price. Have any suggestions or is this a good buy at 1700 I will start to travel a lot starting this summer, and I want something light, portable, and powerful to take with me to do high-end gaming for under two grand. Thanks, Austin. And, uh, boy, I'm... Uh, 
I don't know if we're going to see any mobile GPUs that are going to make a huge difference. I am super curious, uh, as, as we've mentioned in, in the past couple of weeks, about what's going to happen uh, with AMD's 4000 series processors and where those are going to show up. Um, yeah. You know, and, that would be more for your ultra portable gaming laptop rather than your big lunch tray style laptop. But, uh, um, yeah, I, I feel like, if nothing else, waiting to see what happens when those are released and whether or not Intel sort of goes on a cost cutting spree. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the laptop you're talking about there is ninth gen Intel processor. Um, there's, you know, that's a good, solid gaming laptop. Um, so. And, and a good price, too, because that's normally about a $2,000 yeah. laptop. And the RTX 2060 is pretty much the sweet spot for 1080p gaming anyway, because yeah. you can go all the way up on your settings if you want to with a 2060. It's it's not really – a mobile 2060 is not really a 1440 Ultra kind of card. It wasn't on desktop either, yeah. but that's a great 1080p card, and I'm – guessing that's a 1080p screen in that it's a 15.6 inch yeah it's full hd so i mean the one thing you're going to miss out on like patrick said is the processor it's ninth gen intel at some point <laughs> is going to have some of the 10th gen stuff out there it's not necessarily going to be the 10 nanometer well stuff. from cpu it, standpoint it won't yeah. be probably won't be any faster based on the, the tests we've seen um you know ian country's over at uh and Antec noticed that one. Um, you know, your your basic graphics will be considerably faster than a ninth gen. Oh yeah. But you don't care right. because you're getting discrete graphics on that anyway. Um, I was also admiring. Uh, I can't even find the price for the 2080, uh, the uh, Max Q 2080 version of that. Excuse me, the uh, the GeForce RTX 2080 Max Q. Um, yeah, but those are all powering uh, 1080p monitors. So. Yeah, if you want to spend all the money, you have that option. But uh, and, and that's actually, a good price. you know what? Here's here's my little tip: uh, if you can find mm -hmm. one of these with a quote unquote previous generation processor, because they're absolutely. I'm looking on Amazon right now. There are eighth gen Coffee Lake versions with RTX 2060s in them for less money. So if you can live with, you know, really the difference between eighth and ninth gen is virtually nothing. So mm -hmm. if it's same, if it's the same core count save the money and get Coffee Lake because you're not getting any kind of real appreciable difference between 8th and 9th gen, especially not on mobile. Uh, really, with 9th gen on desktop, it, it was introduced essentially to uh, bring in like the Core i9 series, the higher core counts, but like the Core i... Like the 9th gen desktop brought in an 8-core processor to the Core i7. On mobile, it doesn't mm -hmm. really do anything. So that would be my my pick would be find one of these with the RTX 2060 because I think I think that's a great mobile GPU but get Coffee Lake because you'll save money because it's not the current model but will be functionally identical. We get another viewer question uh, twitch at twit.tv Albert emailed us if you have a question do us a favor email twitch at twit.tv it is the place to reach us with your questions and we like to hear them. Uh, we're going to help out a broke gamer here. Albert says, thanks for the podcast. I love the topics on here. I need help. I just bought an HP ZBook G3 with an Intel Core i7 6700 HQ, uh, 16 gigs of DDR RAM, and a 500 gigabyte spinning Western Digital Drive. Got it from a friend's company for 20 bucks, which is awesome. He just installed a uh, or installed a 500 gigabyte Crucial SSD for 66 bucks. Also installed Zorin OS, the free version with Steam. I think that the next version of Zorin I will pay for since I like it so much. My question is, are there any way to make my gaming experience better? I'm a broke gamer, LOL. Should I get a discrete card like an NVIDIA Quadro M1000M or M2000M, or should I buy an eGPU box? And which one to get? Has anyone worked with those on Windows or Linux? I have an RX 484 gig I could throw into an eGPU box. If I went that route, I could load most of the games I want to play using Proton, but running on very low settings. Here are some of the games I need to play as <laughs> I need to play. Gas Extreme Guzzlers, Need for Speed Shift, Doom, Dirt Rally, Axis Footfall, in the 2019, Smashing the Battler, House Flipper, and Tabletop Racing. Any thoughts or suggestions? Very well appreciated. I want to use this amazing HP ZBook since it has great hardware in it. Once again, thanks for the show. 
So yeah. how are you feeling about external GPUs, uh, boxes, toasters, if you will? They're great. I mean, they're not cheap. I think the cheapest ones that I've personally seen are around 200 bucks because you have to, there has to be a power supply involved and they're, they're just expensive. They're, I don't, if there's a $99 one out there, that's good. Then I would love to hear about it because you can cobble one together yourself. You could use an old spare right. power supply and one of those PCI risers and use some sort of adapter, but it becomes kind of this hairy situation where now you have a laptop that you like and you want to keep using it because it has anemic, it, like the 530 graphics are bad. You're talking about setting your games down right. to a very low resolution and lowest settings and still not hitting 30 frames per second. So I can, I don't think you're going to be able to put it in a discrete GPU unless I'm completely wrong. I don't know this model of laptop. Generally right. speaking, if it's ship with a GPU, you're not going to be able to put one in. Maybe it has an MXM slot inside. I don't know. And if you could find a good deal on one, that's Some absolutely of them had low. like, Yeah. I, I don't know if any of them had discrete, like, upgradable, but you're talking about, you know, depending on the model, the more expensive models would have had, like, uh, Quadro GPUs, NVMe okay. SSDs, and, like, 32 gigabytes of RAM. That would have been, like, a $7,000 version of this laptop. Um, it's tough because I mean the the biggest challenge is just simply that um, you know like you said the toasters are expensive <laughs> and uh, you have to connect to them that's the other thing and not only that but you have to have a monitor because then you're talking external monitor now you can't even use your right. built in display because you're you're sending your graphics out to the CGPU box which has to have an external monitor connected to it so now you you should just get a PC at that point. If you're spending two hundred dollars yeah. plus a monitor plus you know a graphics card, at that point it would have been cheaper to just get a, a PC. And honestly, even if it does have an MXM MXM slot or some way mm -hmm. of attaching a, a GPU internally, since it wasn't shipped that way, it will not have the cooling for it. So then you won't have the heat pipes going in the right places, and it just won't work. So. Unfortunately, it's a good productivity machine, but with that kind of graphics uh, integrated, it's never going to really be a gaming laptop unless you use an eGPU. Right. But then there's all the caveats. So it's a yeah. it's well, a it bad situation. I think a lot of people 3. find themselves in. Thunderbolt yeah. 3. Well, okay. So, so that's, yeah, it's definitely a candidate for eGPU. And what is the current price on a Razer Core X Thunderbolt 3? Oh, they're down to $300. So, <laughs> I actually I was looking. Um, da, 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 da. Oh, I don't know if that's proprietary or not. I saw a um, Alienware graphics amplifier for two hundred bucks, but I think that used a proprietary connection. The, Once in a uh, while, the Kidio node. Okay. I was say the Kidio nodes down to like two hundred fifty dollars on Amazon dot com. Um, and this is also funny because we're talking about buying like a two hundred and fifty dollar box. <laughs> For your hey, he says he has an laptop. RX 480 to put in it, so he already has a GPU to put in it. <laughs> and the RX okay. 480 is actually a good candidate for one of these because I think most of these, let's see what the PSU limitation is. A lot of these has like a 600-watt PSU in them, it looks like. 550 watts. So, yeah, more than enough power. But, again, now you've got to find a monitor. And you've got like your laptop daisy chain to an eGPU well, box plug it to the monitor. They have $20 monitors. Maybe they have 1080p or $20 laptops. Maybe they have 1080p monitors. For, oh, true. Uh, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> and I will, honestly, I would have bought this too. If somebody was like, yeah, here are the yeah. specs, 20 bucks, I would have bought it all day long. So yeah. kudos to him for trying to figure out a way to make it into a gaming machine. But that's the annoying thing about laptops. There's just not a whole lot you can do to them. If you do an SSD upgrade, max out the memory, you're pretty much done. Yeah. There's a wall you hit. And so many of them now have the memory or the SSD soldered onto the main board. So there's literally nothing you can do. So, <laughs> yeah. Actually, I wasn't trying to be a jerk, but somebody texted me and asked me about their MacBook Air. Hey, I want to upgrade my MacBook Air. I'm like, oh, what model is it? What what year did you buy it? And he like looked it up. I'm like nothing. What do you mean nothing? There's nothing you can upgrade. <laughs> it's literally all soldered to the board. There's nothing you can do. If you don't like it, yeah. you have to get a new one. If you've run out of storage, 
use external storage because you're you're screwed. Well, you know, I mean, I gotta say, uh, I love SanDisk's little tiny. I don't know if I can get it to focus on this. Um, well, the black, there it is. That's 256 gigabytes of memory right there. So, it's the size of a thumbnail. You know. Yeah, it plugs into USB ports. Uh, they're fairly robust. Um, uh, if I was going, if, if it was going to be killed, it would have been killed uh, living in the side of my laptop for the last year and a half. Um, that is one way to add considerable capacity to your uh, laptop that no longer uh, has it or it just has never had any ability to be upgraded. Um, but, uh, yeah, I love those things. The, uh, oh, I'm trying to get, it's, I'm trying to get how big they get now. Because every time I turn around, like, one terabyte uh, SD cards are out. And... What is the largest fit they have now? Aha, the UltraFit USB 3.1 flash drive. 256 gigabytes still topping out at. So, no one terabyte options there. But if you have 128 gigabytes, 256 gigs on an SSD is a pretty hefty upgrade. That would be nice. Oh, hey, you know what? The Akidio node. That Thunderbolt 3 eGPU, it has an updated, I updated its fake spot review. It is now getting an A, um, or like basically four out of five stars, which is already what it's getting on uh, Amazon.com. So that may be a way to go. If you do get one, Albert, let us know how it works out, because we would be curious to hear of your experiences with that and uh, keep us posted on uh, Zorin OS. That's pretty slick. Uh, it's a pretty slick operating system. Um, goodness, the, uh, I was kind of surprised, uh, HTC had a couple of updates and, uh, Google Sheets is, uh, getting upset at the way I'm trying to scroll down. Um, the new Vive Cosmos VR lineup with quote, swappable face plates. <laughs> um, uh, well, you know, you want to look stylish when you're wearing your VR headsets. And not every headset goes with every outfit. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the Cosmos Elite uh, comes with a faceplate that works with external tracking and also includes two lighthouse base stations. And uh, HTC is positioning the Cosmos Elite as its new option for advanced PC VR games like Pistol Whip and Super Hot. Writes the Verge's Sam Byford. So, just so you know, it's out there. Um, only announcing uh, pricing and availability at this point. Uh, Pre-orders begin on February 24th for $899. And uh, we will see what happens. So, the other thing it, uh, they're talking about is uh, their prototype of an AR headset. It looks like sunglasses. Yeah. Sorry, Robertson uh, wrote that up for The Verge. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, Project Proton you're looking at right now. Just a prototype. And uh, built for mixed or augmented reality experiences. But, writes Ms. Robertson, uh, unlike Microsoft or Magic Leap's mixed reality glasses, they use pass-through video instead of transparent waveguide lenses. So, we'll see. We'll see what happens. We continue to watch VR to see where it goes. And uh, I also want to give a shout out. Uh, it's a really nice article on the register. Um, the computer science responsible for cut, copy, and paste has passed away. Uh, Larry Tesler. Uh, <laughs> He worked at Park at Apple at Amazon. Uh, is arguably uh, the person who put ARM on their course for world domination. Uh, you know, uh, the man who said, "Quote: I have been mistakenly identified as the father of the graphical user interface for the Macintosh. I was not. However, a paternity test might expose me as one of its many grandparents." Um, you know, 
he's the reason why computers suck a lot less than they used to, or one of the re- he's one of the people responsible for computers sucking a lot less than they did in the early days. Um, primarily, uh, uh, getting into the idea of modeless software and, um, uh, yeah, thank you, <laughs> Mr. Tesla. Um, the, uh, you know, he was involved in the Newton project, Apple and, uh, quote writes, uh, the register, which Tesla took over in 1990 and set in motion events that would see the arm dominance of today. The low power consumption of the Silicon while idle appealed, as did its ability not to hammer the battery of the doomed handheld while running. The Newton or message pads, as it was eventually branded, launched in 1993, resplendent in a case designed by a young Johnny Ive. So, but, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, and, uh, our condolences to the family and friends of Larry Tesler. You've been listening to This Week in Computer Hardware. We call it Twitch. You can get more of the shows, all the older shows, information on how to subscribe, links to subscribe at twit.tv slash twitch. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with the show, my name is Patrick Norton. Joining me, as always, is Sebastian Peek, PCPerder.com's editor-in-chief and lead benchmarking maven. And if you haven't been over to PCPerder.com, you should go there because they have lots of good stuff for you to read and listen to or watch on the video front with that ladies and gentlemen we want to thank you for listening to the podcast or watching the video i'm patrick norton i'm sebastian peak we'll catch you next week on twitch <laughs>